For the second example, um, you could uh, have a go at doing the Kruskal Wallace for the parity for the, the baby weights data if you like. I think probably all getting a little bit tired of that data set. It's a nice little data set here on age and memory where they got people to try and remember a list of words and then had a look at the number of words they were able to remember based on whether they were slap, quote older or younger um, and what they call the process or the way that they were asked to remember the words either by counting the letters in the word thinking of rhyming words thinking of adjectives creating an imagery um, or intentional just means intentionally trying to memorize the word um, so you can click the link to read that experiment uh, and I'm going to just have a quick look at how we might deal with this data in SPSS. It does have a couple of nice features. So we will do a non-parametric test in this, although in all honesty you, you don't need to. A parametric test would actually be fine, but I think I was struggling to find a data set which was really appropriate for a Kruskal Wallace test. It's not something I use very often. Um, so we're going to start by looking at the data and we're going to look at the level of processing, so the type of memory technique that they were using um, and whether or not and how many words they could remember. So our outcome variable in this case is the words they could recall. So it's not truly continuous, it's a count variable in that you can you either remember the word or you don't, so it has to be a whole number, it can't be some somewhere on that continuum. Um, but it's, uh, we would treat this as continuous in this case. I, th oh, I can't remember how many words they could have. I think it might, might have been up to 20. We'll see when we do the plot what was the most number of words. Then we've got the age group, which was the older or younger. So if you want to practice doing a t-test, you could have a look at looking at age. Um, and then the process was the memory process that they were using to try and remember it. So if we do a little box plot just of the words recalled and the process, and you'll see that I've got this as words with the little a symbol there and then I've also coded them. There are a couple of places in SPSS where it doesn't like it if you have string variables or words. It wants numbers but I can't remember where that is. Perhaps we will find out. So I had them in both ways in this. So I'm going to use this, the string variable here. So the words record so Maybe the maximum might have been 25. You could go back and read that information and check for that. So what are we seeing here? This is the number of words that people could use if they were thinking of adjectives, if they were counting the letters in the word, if they were using an imagery technique, if they were just trying to memorize them, or if they were thinking of rhyming words. So just looking at this plot, there's a couple of interesting things. There are a couple of outliers here. I'm not too worried about them. They're not that extreme and there's actually one either side. So I don't think that's going to be having much of an effect on the mean here. Um, I guess the more interesting thing is the level of variation in that it seems that people were remembering more words with these two techniques, the imagery technique and just the intentionally trying to remember. A little bit hard to tell from this plot. Is adjective worse than these two or is, could this just be due to random variation so that's where the test will come in handy to help us make a call about this adjective technique but you'll see that the level of variation in the counting and the rhyming is a lot less so for the the less useful techniques it looks like people were kind of equally bad if that makes sense using the counting and the rhyming remembering you know sort of between five and ten words Yet with the better techniques, there was a bit more variation in how many words people could remember. So this is a case where we, we really do seem to have a difference in the variation. So I think if we ran a test for homogeneity of variances, it would tell us the variances are not equal in this case. So um, in terms of the first three assumptions, if we were doing an analysis of variance, we do have an appropriate outcome variable. Um, we've got independent groups, we have um, independence of observations. I'm going to assume these were all separate people taking these tests and that de the design is okay. And then the, this, the second set of assumptions which we look at statistically are the outliers normality and the variance which we've had a quick talk about here. Let's do the, um, the graph for normality as well. Now obviously you can do a formal test of normality. I, I really don't think it's necessary. The ANOVA will hold up very well if it's just sort of normal. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, 
let's you just use the coded one there and so here you can see what we saw above in that these three are quite spread out and the counting and the rhyming are really quite compact so we have a difference in the variation here and we can also see that it's actually not looking particularly normal and this is really down to the small sample size I don't think it's going to cause a problem but if you were very worried about the really small sample size and you wanted to compare the medians instead that might be where you use a non-parametric test. So let's have a look at how we would go about running a non-parametric and then as an exercise if you like you could go and try and run the ANOVA with the test for homogeneity of variances and do the, the Welch um, version of the test. For the non-parametric tests if we were deciding that we, we didn't want to compare the means, it means we're not going to assume they're normal and we're looking at two things. Is the shape of the distribution similar for the five groups? And then is the center or the median the same for the five groups if the, if the shape is the same? And I encourage you to go and read the Laird page for this as well. They've got a nice description of it. If you want to get really super technical, then you can have a look at what it means if the distributional shapes are different what are we actually testing with the center of the distribution? I know for a lot of people that's getting a little bit too into the nitty gritty and you don't care. So non-parametric test. This is the same as last week when we, well not last week, week seven when we had the two groups. So we're doing the same option here. We've got independent samples. Um, let's compare the distributions across the groups. I'll just reset that so you can see me pop them in. We've got the words recalled and then the process. Now this may be the one where in the old version of SPSS maybe it didn't like these string variables. Um, it won't, it doesn't matter. If it accepts it then you should be able to run it. And click run. So it gives us the, the null hypothesis that the distribution of words recalled is the same across the categories. Um, it's doing a kruskal wallace test. The significance is very, very low, so we would reject that null hypothesis. So in words, we would say we've got very strong evidence that there is a difference in the distribution of words. So it's actually telling us that the shape is different for these five groups. And I think what it's picking up on is that we've got the shape for these two is different than the shape for these ones. If we double click into this, we get a bit more output. Um, so it gives us that box plot which we did before, which is quite nice. It gives us the p-value. Um, and then the extra thing that we get if there's more than two groups is we get the pairwise comparisons. So you'll need to click down here and look for the view um, and get the pairwise comparisons. Um, I have no idea what to do with this picture, though I do not find that helpful at all. But we do get this output here. So here it's comparing every pair. So it's saying is the shape the same between counting and rhyming? Yes it is. Is the shape the same between counting and adjective? No it's not. So if we go back um, to here, is the shape the same between counting and rhyming? That's these two and it looks very similar. Is it the same between counting and adjective? No it's not. So this is where it's picking up on the shape being different. The only warning I'll give you for for reading this, and I actually had a comment on a video once, which is always funny because I don't get many comments, nobody watches stats videos, uh, is that this output, in older versions of SPSS, it gets really crammed up. And the question was, how do I make it bigger? And I'm actually not sure. I haven't played around with the settings a lot. So if you find that this output is really, really crammed up, um, I always just do my best to try and read what the number is, but you can probably mess around with the um, the formatting um, with the options or some properties or something for the font sizes, I'm guessing, somewhere to have a look at it. But yes, that was a problem in previous versions that this could be really difficult to read. Uh, okay, so the shapes are different. So we can still test the center of the distributions to see if that's the same. Technically, this is where you're doing a mean rank rather than a, a median. Um, so we would leave this the same and we would say compare medians and I'm okay if that's just what you call it. 
Uh, the only reason I point out that things are sometimes technically different is just because there will be some sticklers who get really upset if I say something which is not technically correct. Um, so the null hypothesis here, which, and you would do this test in conjunction with the previous one, and you can read the layered page for the details of precisely how accurate this wording is, if you are one of those sticklers for um, accuracy, if you're not too bothered and just think of it as testing the medians. The medians are the same across the categories. Um, we've got a really low p-value, so we've got very strong evidence against that null hypothesis, and we would say that the medians are in fact different, and it tells us to reject. And again, we can double click into that, and it says the grand median is 11 and it puts a nice line through and then it's quite kind of obvious from the graph that these two have a lower median and that these three have a higher median. But again we can go into this bit here and get the pairwise comparisons out um, and get the actual p-value for these. And again Oh, look, you can probably get the p-value for each pair off these lines if that's all squished up. I don't find this, this helpful. Like, I can sort of see what they're trying to do with this graph. I don't think it's easy to read, though. So that would be a non-parametric version of the test. Feel free to stop the video here. Just for the people who are interested, I'm just going to go back to the parametric um, ANOVA version and... Um, quickly run that so you can see how you would do it with the Welch. So that would be the compare means one way ANOVA words. Ah, look, so this is the one where it didn't like the string or that it written as words, it only wants the coded value because it's not showing up here, which means it won't do it. Um, so we could do the homogeneity of variance test and get the Welch. And then we could also get our um, because we know that the variances are not equal, do the games howl. So the test for the homogeneity of variances, the null hypothesis is that the variances are equal. We've got very strong evidence against that, therefore the variances are not equal. We'll assume they're not equal. If we look at the Welsh version of the test, the test is the null hypothesis is that the means are the same. We've got very strong evidence against that. And this is one of those cases where you can see that it, it, you might report this if you want to be technically correct, but actually the end result is pretty similar. You're getting a really low p-value either way. So we've got very strong evidence that there is a difference in the means. Here we have all our pairwise comparisons, but we don't get our homogeneous subsets. So that's one of the reasons I don't... Um, I don't like all of the tests as much as I like the, the two keys. So if I run that again with the, the two keys, you see we get the homogeneous subsets here saying that counting and rhyming were pretty similar and adjective imagery and intentional were pretty similar. So imagery and intentional look the best at remembering over 15 words on average and the adjective looked a little bit worse at um, nearly 13 words on average. But statistically, we would say that we don't have any evidence that there is actually a difference between these three. So even though it looks like adjective is worse, statistically, we don't have any evidence to say that it, it is a poorer technique. Um, apologies if you can hear the door slamming in the background. So if we were doing a graph of this, let's do our mean and um, interval plot, confidence interval plot, and we can see here that these two are very different from these three. Okay, so I'll probably leave that video here. So I guess a challenge exercise for you is um, go back and have a look at the difference in age. If you're happy with looking at those two things separately, now depending on which course you're in, if you're in the postgrad course, you should be able to run um, a general linear model for the number of words recalled and look at both age and level of processing together. Uh, if you're in the undergrad version, you probably haven't done either a general linear model or a two-way ANOVA, so you, I wouldn't expect that you can do that. However, you can do a graph of both of these things together. So here we had the level of processing. We could also look at the age group. So here we can see that the younger people are remembering more than the older people. 
But is this um, is there a different effect of these processing technique based on which age group you are in is the question of interest. So is it possible that some memorizing techniques work better for younger people than they do for older people? That might be what you're trying to answer. And if you want to answer that type of question, you really want to look at both these two things together. And that's what you can do with the two way ANOVA and have a look at interaction or um, in SPSS, we would use the general linear model option, which is here. Um, if you haven't done that before, I won't, wouldn't expect you to be able to do that this week, but you could do it in a graph and just have a look at it. And if you go to the web page for this data, you'll see they do a graph with both of those together. And that's where you use this one here, the colored mean and confidence interval plot. So we've already got the age group in there. So let's put the process in up here on the cluster. And now you can see that we've got it split up. Intentional. This is interesting. So I don't know if this is, this is me trying to work out, shaking my head back and forth. Is this the best way to look at this data? Or maybe it'd be better if we had this here and the age there and reverse which way it's clustered. I think I like this better. There's no right or wrong. It's just which is easier to read. And I would, pro I would probably go through and take out these things and maybe put that in a figure legend and I would probably change these colors. So why is this interesting? Can you see where the difference is between the two age groups? And I think you can, you can, you can see it on both of them in that you can see there's a different pattern here for the older people than there is for the younger people, but it sh I think it shows up a little bit better here. So if we look at the, the poor memorizing techniques, the counting and the rhyming, they're kind of equally bad for both the age groups. It doesn't look like there's any difference here. The adjective, um, the imagery and the intentional all look better for the younger age groups in that they're working better for them and they seem to be remembering more words. But I guess the interesting thing to me is this one, this intentional, where they weren't actually given a technique to use, but just told to memorize the words. That actually seems to be having the biggest difference between the two age groups. So I guess the question of interest is, if you just tell people to memorize the words, in the background, what are they trying to do to remember those words? And what's the difference there between the older and the younger people? Because it looks to be bigger than these other two techniques. So I think that's a really interesting data set um, and I'll let you have a look at that and try out your skills. And there's also a third data set in the, um, in the activities for this week where you can go through some of these processes yourself. You can decide which test you think is appropriate and have a go at writing up the conclusions. Um, and then also in the consolidate activities, we've got some, out, um, some papers where I've taken some snippets of the, the tests that they've run and on how they've presented them and get you to interpret what it is that you're reading in these papers uh, based on these tests. So good luck with that. And I will put up the answer sheets at some point uh, towards the end of week eight.